Да, уважаемые коллеги, наверное, давайте начнем. Uh, let's begin, dear colleagues, because we're limited on time. The organizers, because of a lot of fuss and many, many participants and many, many roundtable discussions around, uh, they have limited ourselves on time. We only have one hour and a half. So first, uh, I am Yevtukhov, Deputy Minister for Industry and Trade of the Russian Federation. What we have today here is a topic for this round table that covers both economic and legal aspects of the associations we're going to discuss. That is the Customs Union and the World Trade Organization that Russia has successfully exceeded after 18 years of complicated and creative talks. This is the way I would suggest to structure this discussion. Everybody will speak according to his or her topic, and during the remaining time we will have a discussion. Okay. Hmm? A few words of forward to save time for our speakers. It is well known that uh, Russia's accession talks were held parallel to the shaping of the customs union associating Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia. Overall, this uh, merger of customs territories of these countries, uh, of territories un of countries under the WTO was no unique, but the unique thing was that in this case the process was participated by countries that had not, uh, have not become members of the WTO. Otherwise you may know that we, there are 17 customs unions existing inside the WTO. Correct me if I'm wrong on the number. I think it would not be exaggeration to say that the amount of work done by the Russian Federation was huge. We had to harmonize our legislation with the member states of the customs union and we have to harmonize our legal framework with the standards of the WTO. That we had been actively talking to at the time. I'd like to note, it, note, it's really symbolic that the coming Sunday, May 19th, uh, will be the second anniversary of the very important document, agreement on the functioning of the customs union as part of the multilateral trading system, where parties committed not to allow any decisions contrary to the membership conditions of the WTO in that union. For that purpose, uh, Russia has come up with the, an action plan to harmonize documents and acts uh, of WTO versus the customs union. We, the, according to the action plan, we have to take about 30 measures mostly aiming at harmonizing the legislation. And I was pretty certain, being a lawyer, um, here at the legal forum, I won't give you any names, but uh, I'm really, I feel a lot of gratitude to a large group of lawyers and legal scholars who, academics, who have worked and actively participated in the process and the contractual basis of the customs union of Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan from day one was aimed to fit the requirements of the WTO. Having said this, there are some problems still pending where we need to make amendments to the customs union documents allowing uh, regulating anti-dumping and conventional protective measures for one. We also need to harmonize technical regulations and standards in conformity with the requirements of the WTO. Overall, 
work is still to be done and quite a lot of it. I could give you one example. Yesterday there was a meeting of the uh, Euras EC. The Russian delegation was headed by Mr. Shovala, first Vice Prime Minister, and we yesterday considered some issues such as changing the customs duty rates, introduction of temporary import procedures uh, across the three countries uh, which have different preferences, of course, on tax payments, 88% of that goes to the Russian federal budget. We are more interested in maintaining the rates we have got by now. We were discussing some common documents regulating our joint functioning and further integration, and there's been a lot of argument. It is not that easy, and because of high professionalism on the part of Mr. Shuvalov, uh, we achieved a lot, especially it often happens with uh, Kazakhstan because they're very near to exceeding the WTO, so their situation is quite uh, far from being simple and easy. They want to have it well done on both fronts, WTO and Customs Union, in complying with all rules, principles and norms. So Kazakhstan is soon to join the WTO and these fora a fora like this one will also help them, I hope, to exceed for them and to our partners in Belarus as well. By the way, I'd like to, in connection with all these things, that all adverse predictions regarding Eurasian integration that uh, had been there in place, have not come true. Some opponents asserted that the customs union would never survive after Russia's accession, uh, Russia's WTO accession, and you see from the data the mutual trade has grown nearly by nearly 10 percent since the uh, beginning of the year, twice as much as the volume of trade with third countries. And other countries who are interested, like Ukraine, uh, that amount grew 2.5 times, which was beneficial for both Russia and Ukraine. During this roundtable discussion, we will have some relevant topics discussed in the context of ongoing accession of the Customs Union member states to WTO. The practice and judicial practice of the Eurasian Court, Eurasian Economic Space Court would be touched upon and would like to pay special attention to trade investigation practice and protective measures as applied in the customs union. That's a very important thing. It's an open secret that vis-a-vis -vis these countries, including Russia, there are more than 70 protective measures in place, while we use about 15 of protective measures. We're less fanatical and more humane towards our partners. And there are experts who can share a lot of positive experience in participating in such disputes. I'm ready to give the floor to our first speaker, who is Nikolai Mizulin, partner from Mayor Brown, Europe, Brussels, LLP. Mr. Mizulin participated in some very large disputes on the WTO, representing the interests of various states, frequently, regularly advising clients for multilateral or bilateral trade negotiations and WTO accession negotiations, and he will speak of the uh, our customs union legal capacity of Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. In St. Petersburg, it's been customary to talk about revolutions. You know, this is the, such is this place and I cannot avoid this temptation. So let me touch on the topic already titled by 
the moderator, the legal capacity of the Customs Union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. That's a revolutionary topic in terms of uh, international law, the Customs Union, and in from the very particular perspective of the interests of Russian businesses. Uh, this is a very paradoxical situation, isn't it? The USSR, until the late 80s, did not recognize the European Union as the only existing customs union in the world at the time. That was for political reason, which is very interesting to read documents from that time. In 1951, the Soviet Union, in response to the establishment of the European Association of Coal and Steel, sent a diplomatic note uh, considering uh, that as a threat of a German aggression repeated. Being afraid that creation of such an association would further the exploitation of the laboring people in all the countries of Europe. And during various negotiations later on, the USSR never recognized European associations as subjects of international law. This is a paradox because nowadays, at least in our relationship with the European Union, now the topic of recognition of legal uh, personality is quite a relevant topic. We would like to have someone from the European Commission for this roundtable discussion. We were not able to because of some logistics issues, but Meanwhile, the EU is in talks on uh, establishing new international treaties, not with the customs union, but with individual member states of the customs union. So recognition of judicial or legal existence or legal personality, that's a real cornerstone element in this topic. Another reason why this is an interesting topic for Russia and Russian customers that I work with, Russian businesses, this is because, as you are well aware, after Russia succeeded the WTO in, that was done in August 2012, WTO accession is always a painful process. Maxim Yurievich Medvedkov is right to say that the positive effect will only come five years from now, while now, Russian industries are mainly in pains because of liberalization of the customs duties. Therefore, one another means of getting advantages for Russian exports and improving its competitiveness in external markets would be exactly the activity of the customs union in concluding international treaties and creating the free trade zones. Uh, this already started, at least in our relationships uh, with Vietnam, and there are even more major candidatures. There is an idea of having talks with India. Uh, those markets are very interesting for our exporters at this time, especially because regional agreements on free trade zones uh, are very relevant uh, and otherwise we could lose, because we're losing competitiveness in the European Union, India, for instance, have some agreements with Korea, which touch upon Russian chemical industries in a negative way. So if we can create a free trade zone agreement, uh, that will also depend on the fact if the customs union has the international legal existence in full sense of the world, of the word, with full set of obligations and rights. Uh, this is also to say that both in the academic environment, putting aside political problems uh, between Russia and the EU, legally speaking, there are no doubts that both the Eurasian, uh, Eurozac, and the Customs Union will both be subjects of international law 
possessing all the characteristics mentioned back in 1949 on the case of the UN responsible liability, the classical criterion of uh, legal existence, legal personality and the analysis of the legal framework of, of all these unions allowed to conclude that all of them are legally existent and this way we can make a conclusion that international legal existence does exist. Uh, there is a founding treaty in place, international treaty, on whose basis the customs union was set up. We all know, Viktor Leonidovich mentioned it now, that there is an organizational structure in place of the customs union. The Eurasian Economic Commission exists and the Eurasian Court, not less importantly, according to the treaty on a single customs territory and the treaty to secure the organizational structure of the customs union, Stru uh, fully regulates the rights and obligations of the customs union as an international organization and importantly again the Eurasian Economic Commission and court they enjoy uh, diplomatic immunity which is another characteristic of legal existence I will not cover all the aspects of international legal existence of the customs union I'm only highlighting the key ones which is the ability to enter into international treaties, including free trade zone agreements. You may be aware that that opportunity is explicitly stated in the agreements that underlie the customs union, in particular in the agreement on the creation of the Eurasian Economic Commission, where it is explicitly stated that according to the decision of the Higher Economic Council, Intergovernmental Council, the Eurasian Economic Committee may be given the, a mandate for talks, for negotiations done by the Eurasian Economic Commission, and also mentioned is the right to sign respective agreements. Why, in fact, this sounds very banal, why is this a revolutionary thing to mention? Let me just mention a few things in passing. First of all, in the international law theory, and I'm referring to the analogy of the European, European Union, there is a principle of parallelism. The treaty as such does not explicitly state uh, that if some authorities are given to the supranational level, like with the customs duty, then the uh, authority is not to be found at the national level. It would sound logical, but at least in theory of international law would say, and according to EU law, uh, on the same issues based on the parallelism principle, there will be the right of the customs union to conclude negotiations and enter into agreements on these matters. And again, logically, that states, member states of the customs union will be exempt of that right so there will be there is an exclusivity exclusivity of uh, international legal obligations regarding authorities that are given to the supranational level secondly there is an acute matter of recognition talking from the perspective of the international law uh, given the characteristics i mentioned international organization does exist uh, no recognition is required that is a more that is more of a political thing that I already mentioned from the perspective of how it would function basically we took the model of the European Union uh, the mod uh, the mandate was given by the member states and the council uh, executive body the commission uh, was conducting the talks and then depending on the matters touched upon by the international treaty it would be up to ratification by the treaty that would be quite enough for concluding the respective international treaty or a ratification could be done by the council or national parliaments uh, within their respective terms of reference. That is not detailed so far. It has to be done still, but the logic is already there. And it is like this. Finally, 
regarding the possibility of joining the customs union. Uh, it's the same as with another, uh, with the WTO, another object of international law. Uh, according to Marrakesh Agreement, the problem is there is no problem of the customs union exceeding the WTO because customs unions may be part of WTO according to the agreement and that authority is given to the national level in the customs union therefore uh, supranational level therefore the custom the union may conduct talks and uh, exceed the problem is no sensation there. The problem is that currently the customs union in terms of WTO norms is not in line, is not compliant with Article 24 because that article exempts uh, from the most favorable nation regime. And that is only valid if that agreement uh, in involves uh, get member states and only two of them are not uh, WTO member states and therefore strictly speaking the customs union is not in line with WTO principles we had a lot of discussion and debates with the WTO they have the customs union with Andorra EU and Andorra so that is more of a kind of academic dispute because that is also not in line with the WTO rules. But uh, practically speaking, uh, it will be done the same way as uh, when Kazakhstan is exceeding, and uh, Kazakhstan will do it soon. So even the customs union will be able pretty soon to be a full-fledged uh, member of the WTO. It's another story. Is it worthwhile of doing that? There is an experience of the EU, who is a direct member of the WTO. Uh, there is an example, a different example of, Swiss, uh, of the customs union of Switzerland and Liechtenstein, where formerly, and these countries formerly, are not WTO members. So, and that is uh, largely the political thing, and that will be cleared up once all the three member states are WTO members. But for everybody else's convenience, uh, it would be better to, to have a situation where the customs union, its bodies and representatives uh, be a full-fledged member of the WTO. That would be more convenient. The way it is done uh, with EU, there may be representatives of uh, national representatives, but without the right to speak. It's all decided at conference by the EU representative. So basically, people you need to talk to about that they should come from the supranational body. And that's a matter for, to be decided in the future. And once again, let me emphasize that while we are actively working on the matters of WTO and other economic development matters, while legally speaking, the legal substance of the customs union is an area where interesting revolutionary events are taking place. Let's hope uh, there have been few precedents of the same. There are lots of disputes uh, in this work, but that's the whole point of creating the customs union to as an integration. Uh, let's hope its international legal existence will only grow and s grow stronger and clearer, which again will create large advantages for Russian businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Nikola. Would you please, colleagues, for the sake of our time limit, please follow the time limit of maximum 10 minutes so that everybody can speak who is willing to. Let me give the floor to our European colleague, uh, Professor uh, Siddiq Siyad Mohammed, Stockholm University, 
it so happened that Europe for the whole civilized world is the part of the world that uh, gave us Roman law, the French Revolution, many, many philosophers, whether we'll, we want it or not, Europe is a sort of benchmark for everybody. And it is very interesting to hear the review of legal practices of the EU in conducting talks and concluding international treaties under the WTO. You have the floor, please. Uh, uh. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the panel, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here for the third consecutive year in this forum. Uh, last year I was in the panel on Eurasian EU legal reality. Uh, in fact, I am uh, representing Stockholm University, but as you could see, I am uh, I'm from Sri Lanka. It's my uh, background. And the last year, we had an interesting panel discussion the, on the subject which I said, Eurasian and uh, European Union. Uh, there was a high-level representation, one from Commission. Uh, there were a lot of differences of opinion, so a Sri Lankan have to act as more like a peacemaker in between. Uh, but we don't have to go into those extreme uh, situations. What I propose to do is uh, uh, to look into the European model uh, to what extent uh, this could be adaptable uh, at, uh, for example, at the Eurasian uh, level. Uh, now, uh, my uh, main idea, it's very wide area, the relations between the EU's Customs Union and WTO. Uh, there is a current uh, uh, legal initiative taken by the European Union, uh, how to effectively enforce the WTO rulings which are given in favor of the European Union. Now, uh, this has become a, a necessity, especially because uh, you have a new uh, treaty called the Lisbon Treaty, which came into force, I think, two, three years ago. Uh, under the new uh, treaty framework, uh, those who are familiar with the European Union model, uh, there are several institutions. Uh, now, under the new model, the European Parliament the, is given a, a very wide uh, powers how to enforce these uh, WTO rulings under the European law. Now, uh, I think this is a, a model, I think, which should also be followed by the Eurasian economic community, especially the customs union between Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. In fact, I was in Kazakhstan Two weeks ago, I was teaching some students at the University of Taras, and I uh, just explained to them uh, the problems now the European Union have uh, when they try to enforce some beneficial rulings coming to the uh, European Union. For example, uh, most of the disputes EU is having is with the United States. Uh, they are having a, a lot of favorable uh, uh, judgments or rulings from the panel, WTO, but it takes uh, two, three years sometimes to enforce that. So by that time, the benefit the European gets, Union gets from the WTO uh, to exercise against the US uh, is lost because by the time they could have used, after two, three years, both parties would have come to an agreement. So now, uh, last December, European Union uh, there are three actors involved now to make this law. The Commission has come with a proposal, that is the executive body of the European Union. Uh, they have submitted a proposal to the Council and the Parliament. Uh, last December, I think, uh, they have almost agreed on this regulation. Now, under this regulation, it will give uh, wide powers to the Commission uh, to enforce the favorable rulings from the WTO. Now, uh, the idea is uh, uh, to make sure, to protect also the companies and the workers from the European Union, which was very difficult under the current system. As I said, it takes a long time uh, to enforce the favorable uh, uh, judgments. Then, uh, uh, currently, uh, there is another 
issue which is very much discussed at the European Union level, whether uh, companies, private companies in the European Union can rely on the findings of the WTO rulings and use it against the European Union institutions. Now, uh, most of you who are familiar with this WTO law, this is uh, an agreement between sovereign states. So it doesn't give the private actors uh, a direct uh, right of action to claim for damages or whatever. Now, this is the same situation we have in the European Union level. There have been a lot of cases uh, which came up uh, before the European judicial body, the European Court of Justice, uh, trying to claim da damages against the EU institutions uh, when the WTO finds uh, uh, something that the EU has done wrong and then that has caused damage to the European companies to do business with uh, uh, third uh, countries. Now, uh, the current uh, legal situation is like any other place, uh, there is no right of private enforcement of the WTO rulings. Now, uh, sometimes uh, this could change uh, with the current uh, treaty framework we have, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, there are two things which I think might have an impact on the future uh, thinking of the Court of Justice. One is uh, that European Union have uh, introduced what is called uh, a Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, under this charter, it gives uh, a lot of uh, property rights to private persons, including companies. So here, the Court of Justice is, will be required that if the action of the EU institutions, if it uh, cause any damage to any company, they should be able to raise this before the Court of Justice to claim damages. Now, so far no cases has come up on that. Uh, then the second uh, development, which could also have an impact on the current situation on the private uh, enforcement of the WTO rulings is that uh, Lisbon Treaty says European Union should sign up to the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, uh, under the European Convention also, there are very strong uh, uh, private rights which is protected there. So now the European Court of Justice also have to uh, look at the European Convention on Human Rights as part of the European law. So these two uh, legal instruments can be something used by the private uh, parties, uh, but still it has to be uh, tested. Uh, now this is, uh, I think, uh, the regulation which I said uh, earlier, number one, uh, this is something uh, which could also be used by the Eurasian uh, economic community because customs union, we have three countries, so you should have uh, some kind of uh, legal tool to enforce your rights uh, quickly because the European experience is, uh, even though they get the best uh, uh, rulings from the panel, they cannot really benefit because of the time factor. So this is an area where Eurasian, I think, and economic community uh, can follow. Now, last year I uh, made a comparative study in this uh, uh, panel that uh, uh, to what extent Eurasian economic community should follow the EU model. Of course, EU model is an excellent model. Uh, it's followed in many countries. Eurasian, of course, is one of them. But it also has its uh, limitations with all the fiscal crisis, financial crisis, and other problems. So it's uh, no point in uh, just uh, adopting 100% what is EU is doing into the Eurasian thing. So it's always best to get the, the best out of the models. Uh, I think uh, uh, I don't want to go into more details. So subsequently, I think if you have any questions uh, uh, to be raised about the EU or the EU and WTO, I'd be very pleased to uh, react. Thank you. Спасибо за доклад. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to turn the floor over to Ms. Anna Zmbatyan. 
She's director of the uh, legal department for just uh, competition and uh, market production from the Mitchell company. She is working uh, on the uh, dissertation uh, PhD and just the effectiveness of the WTO and its ability to integrate depend not only on the political will uh, displayed by the member states and just the efficient legal environment and base, but also on the effectiveness of the judicial system and the uh, uh, Eurozest court status uh, uh, largely will depend uh, just on, on that and uh, the efficiency of dispute resolution as well. So, Anna, you have the floor. Uh, dear colleagues, as you know, the bodies, international judicial bodies uh, and arbitration courts were originally established to uh, provide for the peaceful resolution of the disputes. So, so it is part of the UN Charter. Uh, however, the functional uh, 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 functions of the modern judicial bodies are much wider because they, by their decisions, make contribution to the development of international law. So they also um, provide for the legal order and authority of international organizations in the framework of which they had been established. So a wonderful example of this is a WTO di uh, dispute um, uh, settling body and uh, the functionality, uh, functional extension of the ju international judicial and, and the legal borders uh, uh, also applies to the ones uh, that uh, function at the uh, regional level. And the decisions taken by such uh, uh, judicial bodies provide for the single legal uh, field. Uh, so the effectiveness uh, of the implementation of this function by the international judicial bodies depends on two major factors. The first being the powers of the court uh, which are set out in the appropriate statutes and uh, uh, charter documents. And just if we speak about the Eurozac Court, uh, we face two uh, um, uh, uh, shortcomings that were originally there. So the subject jurisdiction of this court is restricted only to economic disputes. And uh, according to some of the academics, uh, the function of this court is boiled down to that of the International Arbitration Court. And the second one is the status of the decisions, which is a, a kind of a, has a, a precedent or case uh, by case status uh, in the interpreting of the um, European law. So if uh, there are binding, uh, the conditions of binding decisions, but the economic decisions of Eurozac court are, have, are non-binding, they only have a recommendation status. And it's uh, bad because uh, such non-binding nature can entail uh, fragmentation of law within Eurozac. Uh, the first decision ruling taken by the Eurozac uh, in 7, September 2012 uh, was uh, uh, just uh, claims in the decision of one of the court uh, that uh, during the export uh, of the commodity of the 27th group, uh, the Russian companies uh, 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 should uh, uh, declare such commodities while exporting them to Belarus and to Kazakhstan, which is at odds uh, with uh, certain agreements concluded with Eurozac. So that uh, decision was supported by the uh, appellation, and just then uh, certain amendments were uh, taken. But uh, so far, this has not been uh, um, f fulfilled in force by the uh, Russia. Uh, 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 there are clarifications by the Russian Customs Service that the, despite the Eurozac court decisions, Russian companies still need to declare uh, these commodities uh, while exporting them to Kazakhstan on a mandatory basis. It is a good example that the Eurozac court decisions are not enforced in practice and uh, it affects the efficiency of the legal order. 
uh, in Eurozex. So similar issues uh, uh, faced uh, the European Union. And uh, so the European Court of Justice has direct effect and supremacy over the national law. And these decisions uh, uh, constitute the bulwark of the legal order. And uh, these decisions were made not on the basis of the uh, literal interpretation of the uh, European law, but uh, uh, the views of the, they reflect the views of the court of what this legal order should be. It is very important because they were taken uh, either uh, on the just inalienable competence of the uh, European Court of Justice, because there were no legal provisions. That so the uh, so uh, it depends a lot on the course what legal order in the Eurozac is uh, is going to be. So, and the Euro international status of the Eurozac court uh, depends a lot on the Eurozac and the community effort itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Your presentation was the shortest. However, uh, just this uh, uh, big applause that you received uh, bespeak of its uh, topical uh, nature. Uh, I would like to turn the floor over to Igor Danilov, who is a senior uh, lawyer from Dentons, and uh, he will speak about the uh, trade remedies uh, uh, and standards uh, in WTO. So his topic sounds uh, very interesting because in my uh, introduction I said that Russia resorted to about 70. Uh, just we. Uh, we uh, European Union has seven, about 70 protection measures, and we have about 13 or 17. So uh, in customs union, it would be very interesting to, to know the situation there. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Igor Danilov. I'm a uh, senior uh, lawyer in the Denton's Brussels office, and we have been dealing with uh, the trade remedies and uh, trade protection standards for a long time. The so trade remedies is uh, one of the major foundations of the WTO rules and uh, international trade rules. It's a practical field uh, that has a very prompt effect on the situation on the market. Uh, there is a uh, just triade uh, of the agreements, there's the special remedies, anti-dumping law, and uh, subsidies and compensations. Uh, but we can distinguish, uh, to cat categorize it into two groups, anti-dumping and compensation measures, and the uh, respective agreements. Uh, originated over 100 years ago when the United States of America began to first uh, apply them, and just they originated as the competition protection measures uh, on the markets, uh, on the national markets, and with the development of international trade, they extended to include international uh, uh, dimension. Uh, it uh, imposes conceptual restrictions uh, on the use of them. So the theory of the market protection and taking into consideration the balance of the consumers, producers, and uh, the role of the investigating bodies and the mm, uh, government is uh, very important in order to ensure uh, their prompt and effective use. Uh, so the special uh, uh, protection measures, special remedies, uh, originated during the integration process, so WTO. So first they appeared in 1947 in GATT, uh, when the uh, state members signing the GATT agreement wanted to have guarantees that uh, uh, should uh, the barriers be dismantled or uh, the uh, uh, duty rates will go down, they will be able to protect their national economies and resort to efficient uh, measures. Uh, so, like I said, with development of integration and international trade and extension of WTO and uh, get uh, these instruments, 
became more legally developed and better interpreted, uh, they can be uh, so this increase in duty rates or uh, uh, temporary increase in duty rates or uh, imposing of uh, quality, quantitative restrictions on imports and others uh, it has it is uh, it can uh, be subject of the investigation uh, just it takes about three to four months which is quite an effective and prompt mechanism of support for national producer and protection of the national markets effectiveness also includes the speed notion it is important that these measures are applicable to all types of commodities including agricultural products and this is an increasing trend recently uh, it is uh, possible to use uh, uh, several uh, measures anti-time, anti-dumping and compensation, for example, together. And this is, uh, we know all this uh, uh, chicken uh, disputes between China and uh, U.S., uh, timber and uh, pipes and others. Uh, so special rules of uh, anti-dumping measures to countries of non-market uh, economy, just China undertook these uh, responsibilities, uh, so that uh, uh, the special discrimi uh, discrimination approach can be applicable, which affects the cause of the investigation as a result. Uh, in the United uh, EU and the uh, US, uh, we see it as a dumping, uh, uh, just rates, uh, duty rates, uh, 50, 500 or 600 percent. So Russia cannot use this instrument so far uh, due to uh, largely political reasons. Mm, but there could be some uh, loopholes and bypasses, and it is important, uh, uh, considering the weight of the Chinese industry and uh, the input from China, uh, just that uh, also could become an effective tool. So in, in terms of the international trades and international trade instruments, um, uh, so there should be some exam exemptions, but they um, basically became a massive practice in many WTO members. So first there was EU and the United States who tried to use it to compensate uh, the small minimum uh, duties on uh, industrial goods. And so now Brazil, India, China, and others uh, who just use these measures and uh, just launch investigations in dozens and dozens of cases. Uh, so the major standards um, are WTO agreements and uh, investigations by special dedicated bodies. Uh, uh, instituted by the uh, states, and it is very important to determine the uh, effectiveness, uh, whether it's a court, an arbitrator, or an independent arbitrator, where are his preferences and interests is what is more important uh, to protect the interests of the producers or consumers, for example, automotive parts for further uh, mechanical uh, production. So uh, lobbying, uh, how uh, transparent it should be, what rules and procedures should be adopted. So all these little things affect, uh, help to strike the right balance to effectively use these instruments. Uh, these are economic and legal uh, uh, field that is involved in accounting and international law. Uh, it is very important to take into account industry-related uh, uh, particularities. Uh, so the system of uh, import uh, expenses and costs, uh, considering today's uh, integration level and division of lev level labor, this requires a close attention. Uh, so different control bodies and committees, uh, there is a judicial practice in WTO, which is quite extensive uh, in different uh, technical uh, issues uh, in uh, interpreting uh, um, 
some of the uh, notions. WHO is based on the Anglo-Saxon case law. Hence, the decision of the arbitrators and appeal courts, though being a, a precedent by nature, it is important uh, each time to consider it uh, separately on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, in every investigation and specific issues. So this gives rise to the specific knowledge of this or that industry and the uh, WTO rules are important. So you cannot just uh, take a quote uh, from the uh, WTO panel and perceive it as, a law, as law, which uh, is not disputable and questionable. This is not so. Uh, uh, Russia's uh, obligations by on accessing on accessing WTO is to uh, comply with the anti-dumping special measures and uh, uh, all other requirements and uh, major rulings. And uh, in the report of the working group, this was closely followed. All other members of WTO were interested in two major things. Uh, so the uh, legal status of the uh, customs union, so who will do the investigation part, whether there is uh, uh, any opportunity to uh, file an appeal. And the procedural issue was also closely looked at, uh, uh, including transparency of procedures, the confidentiality of information rules, publications of the results uh, of the proceedings, and non-confidential information, and so on. Another important thing uh, relates to the Eurozac court, which also was looked at in the report of the working group. It's going to be an organ uh, of appeal, the uh, almost last resort before the WTO, uh, where you can fi file an appeal. Uh, today, there is no practice uh, available. It is in we will see how it will work out in future. De considering that uh, the, the, there is uh, extensive practice of the EU, uh, we'll see how it will go. We'll soon know this. Uh, what uh, is the uh, current practice? Uh, uh, I can speak on behalf of the law engaged in these investigations uh, without involving any political. Uh, this is uh, in WTO. Uh, there is a special anti-dumping compensation measures uh, agreements. Uh, so formally, uh, everything complies with WTO rules. There are no major breaches or violations that we could have detected. The only exception being the status of the uh, parties. So anti-dumping and constitutional or special members in there was a kind of a, a, a conflict. Uh, so the customs union brings together all the three measures, but uh, each of them has their own specificity, which gives rise to certain disagreements and terminology issues, uh, which will lead to the uh, just you know, violated uh, kind of protection uh, defense rules. Another important issue is the further integration of the customs union and as a free trade area. Uh, agreement was concluded in 2011. There is a special provision on special uh, trade remedies and, and measures, and the in, uh, interaction between WTO law and the customs union law in this agreement uh, is very interesting. So the Ukrainian colleagues uh, just invoked them uh, uh, special protection measures because they wanted to bid import from their country, but it turned out to be quite a challenging process for them. Uh, the, there are uh, uh, about currently 15 measures and there are investigations carried out. The uh, temporary preference is given on to the uh, special measures uh, and just the risks uh, of the uh, just uh, uh, under the WTO, investigation are quite high. Uh, so it also due to the WTO requirements and, and rules. Uh, so if we want to combat imports f uh, from uh, China and Southeast, so we uh, need to introduce special measures and need to learn how to do it effectively. 
So uh, the uh, prote uh, just protection measures, the remedies are uh, an exemption rather than a practice. Uh, should be they should be invoked in very special circumstances, in unpredictable situations during uh, that could not have been foreseen at the negotiation stage. So the economic crisis uh, uh, played a key role in kind of you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, increasing the, the use of the special measures uh, worldwide. Uh, all the investigations on the special uh, measures of protection are based on the statistic uh, uh, data on the import in 2009 and 10 when there was when the WTO effect was not as great as it is now. So I'm happy to take questions about it further. Uh, to increase effectiveness, uh, first, uh, uh, it is important, and just the uh, Department of Special Protection uh, displayed very uh, high-level competence and qualification and effective work. And uh, in the Ukraine and Kazakhstan practice uh, that, uh, is very different. Different. Uh, I'm trying to squeeze within the time limit. Uh, but I'll come back to it. It is a, a, a critical issue which determines a lot of things. A good quality, high quality of analysis of, uh, that complies with all international standards, uh, uh, compliance with the general uh, uh, public uh, requirements, notification, consultations, disclosures, and uh, others. There are almost no technical system uh, uh, computation uh, uh, errors, like in the uh, compensation margins and others, so just what was presented uh, proved uh, to be uh, on very high uh, quality level. The uh, uh, existing risks in some specific uh, decisions when WTO rules uh, are transplanted onto the, sit on the specific situation, they are beyond the boundaries of the acceptable interpretation. Uh, uh, do, uh, uh, from the point of view of the WTO rules, uh, uh, if we had a panel on just uh, special protection measures on uh, just wheat harvesters, for example, WTO would have uh, supported it. Only the independent arbitrator or a court can uh, resolve this issue, and the Eurozac court's uh, role in this uh, is to be of critical importance because it takes the dispute on to a higher uh, political level with quite different set of interests and issues and procedures involved. Like I said, uh, just this special protection measures prove quite vulnerable. Uh, so uh, what our colleagues uh, focused on during the accession talks is the violation of uh, protection rights. Uh, uh, first, it's filing uh, of applications and preparation of the industries uh, and their applications on be on basis of which the Eurozac has to conduct investigation and take a well-weighted and well-informed decision. So, uh, two reasons for, for such uh, situation and weakness. So, first is uh, increasing the quality of uh, complaints, uh, which is uh, beyond doubt necessary. And after the balance uh, is rectified, the quality of documents and complaints and economic data and substantiation uh, is uh, higher so than the department. Uh, can be requested to accelerate and increase uh, the process and increase the uh, effectiveness of espresso because they do need time to process all the documents. And then it will make sense to introduce amendments, some cosmetic changes uh, targeted at uh, improving efficiency into the relevant, invest relevant legislation, which is an uh, accelerate the times and uh, or just uh, of the investigation and just extend the period of time from six to nine months of investigation or beyond it. Uh, and at the same time, 
Uh, new limitations will be imposed on the uh, defendant, not the 90 days, which uh, are available now to provide response, but 30 days and so on and so forth. And from this standpoint, the changes in the legal uh, foundation may be cosmetic. Internal rules of procedure are also interested how the consulting committee uh, uh, works its interest. So far, it is just uh, like a black box. We do not know how the Consulting Council on Trade works in the Eurasian uh, Economic Commis Committee. We do not know the, uh, much about the role of the and the role of the uh, anti-dumping, uh, anti-monopoly, say, uh, uh, a committee. So it's something which concerns everyone. So far, it's uh, difficult to find details or heads of that. Perhaps. Uh, 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 there is still room for some lobbying, but nevertheless, we believe that there will be more clarity and transparency. The key conclusions, which I am coming to the end, the system works quite satisfactorily, considering the phase. Other members of WTO are monitoring the work of the Eurasian Economic Committee very attentively. Had there been any serious violations, there would have been definitely uh, claims, uh, accusations. They are very eager to find any, uh, uh, say, uh, drawbacks or wrongdoings in the uh, uh, practice of the Eurasian Economic Committee, but so far there are uh, not many, if uh, none. Well, from the standpoint of increasing the quality of the uh, quality is the concentration of the national industry. That means that all uh, national uh, industry uh, confederations should uh, become a more uh, should become stronger, uh, should come together, should say uh, hire uh, legal uh, uh, wizards, experts, and share the expenses. That will increase highly the uh, quality of complaints filed and so and the technical issues uh, is important from technical point of view the combination of anti dumping uh, uh, compensation investigations i think is the only practical way to uh, stand off against the increased importation of uh, asian goods in uh, the territory of the customs union of great importance is the role of the future a practice of the court of uh, EAEC. One cannot uh, over uh, uh, overvalue or estimate the importance of this role. The Doha round uh, negotiations are continuing. There are many interesting issues we should be uh, looking at. Uh, as you know that uh, you, United States and the EU are not happy with various uh, uh, limitations in terms of the use of financial resources as a national advantage. So we uh, need to uh, develop a very strong, uh, founded position and to make it uh, make a strong statement. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I'll be pleased to take your questions, if any. Thank you for the related presentations. I have no doubt there will be questions, but we uh, agree that uh, first all the speakers will make their presentations, and only then we will uh, come uh, proceed to the questions and answer as sessions. Uh, well, uh, so far we are proceeding with our uh, agenda, and we'll be drawing some of the conclusions. Uh, uh, we say that as there is, some people would say that as a result of the accession to WTO, some of the industries in Russia would uh, uh, suffer a, a lot. We are monitoring now the uh, uh, list of the sensitive goods. So far, we believe the situation is under control. We have tried our best to negotiate concessions for us both in terms of the tariff regulations and non-tariff measures. Uh, however, uh, we have already been with, in the WTO for about a year, and we can draw some conclusions uh, well, the uh, and I would like to give the word to Igor Zitunov, who is a partner in a known uh, company, a law firm, and he will be our. Uh, he has a great deal of experience in operations in the sphere of international trade, and I believe he has uh, gained experience, recent experience in the resolution of international trade uh, disputes. Uh, so uh, we believe uh, he will be able to give a good presentation. Good morning, my name is Ivan Smirnov. Uh, I indeed work in the St. Petersburg uh, 
uh, law forum, we got a foot in the and partners. Uh, after a year of our accession to WTO, let us try to figure out the key risks. It's, uh, too, it's late uh, whether, uh, to argue whether we were supposed to be in that club or not, because all uh, developed nations, I mean developing nations, are part and parcel uh, of these organizations. There are 159 members in WTO. To stay outside the perimeter of the organization would have been inadmissible for us. Uh, whether we could have been done more to protect our national uh, uh, players, yes, perhaps, yes, uh, that's true, and we still continue to do that. My, my presentation will deal with those actions, additional actions which could be or should be taken now on an urgent uh, basis to get that effective uh, protection and to make use of those opportunities which are available under the uh, uh, situation of uh, the WTO tools uh, in the uh, say situation of uh, uh, transborder competition uh, for uh, markets, for uh, access to uh, sources of uh, materials. The key challenge is that uh, we don't have an open, uh, well, strategy of our participation in this organization. There are many general statements to the fact there is a program to protect certain industries. However, uh, the uh, industries and the national players are not aware of this program. That's why we believe more. We believe we need more transparency and an open dialogue so that uh, we should not have uh, any uh, questions asked from a number of uh, national industries, and uh, we believe that uh, more publications enhancing transparency are in question. Interaction between the uh, state, uh, the government, and the business should be uh, uh, promoted uh, um, in a, on a bigger uh, way. In the USA, for example, uh, there are certain rules uh, regulating the uh, relations between business and uh, the government uh, regarding uh, filing any f uh, complaints with under the WTO rules. Such uh, rules and procedures formalize the process of obligatory nature of reviewing of uh, uh, complaint, because now uh, with the, in the situation of the absence of such rules, even if a uh, complaint is filed, it may not be ignored. The one window, uh, say, tools in Europe, in the United States, this instrument is quite effective. It stands above the department, above the ministry, so it makes room for a interaction uh, for uh, government, uh, for uh, ministries and agencies among themselves. In our case, we have, uh, say, splitting of some uh, responsibilities for some issues. Ministry of Economic is responsible for, and uh, in uh, some, uh, for some issues, some other uh, departments uh, or ministries are responsible. So we need more convergence and interaction. Uh, also, specifically against the uh, backdrop of our participation in trade uh, organization, because it's the, gov the Russian government which uh, implements uh, in that. But it is the an another agency which uh, is supposed to be responsible for, uh, um, say, implementing uh, protection measures. Uh, of great importance is to use those tools which are available uh, by WTO. The uh, practice of uh, leading trade uh, nations, uh, our trade partners in Europe, in the States, and uh, uh, Brazil, China, says that such proactive policy is very effective. Participation, for example, as a third party in those uh, disputes which uh, are initiated by nations, country members. If we look at the statistical data, then we will see that it, you know, self-evident in this uh, area uh, we have been, uh, say, doing uh, uh, quite a lot recently, and uh, I think we have participated as a third party in as many as seven uh, cases uh, under the WTO rules. Speaking about Brazil, Brazil participates in uh, such uh, capacity in 70 uh, cases, India in 85, the uh, United States uh, and participated in one, about 100 uh, say cases and so on and so forth. So this is a very effective tools which allowing 
uh, to form certain coalitions with other nations and to protect uh, your national interest within the participation, not as a claimant, but as a third party uh, representing specific uh, written position uh, in respect of the case under review. Uh, it would be also uh, uh, interesting to uh, anticipate a phase when we should be more active as a claimant making a specific claims. The practice of the leading trade nations says that this proactive uh, stand uh, uh, can allow you to reap benefits, uh, good benefits if you have about, say, between 90 to 110 claims uh, to our uh, trade partners, including uh, Europe, European Union, European Community, United States, China. That means that we should, at a certain point in time, test uh, the ground, so to speak, or test the water and to make formal uh, claims with the respective, uh, say, uh, uh, statements to the appropriate, appropriate authorities. Uh, speaking about the, uh, oh, those things which should be done in a mandatory way in the very near future, I should uh, mention, perhaps, uh, as Igor mentioned, to, this is to form and to protect national uh, interest of national players within business associations and unions. Obvious, it's obvious that no business, uh, no company would be able to uh, sustain, uh, uh, say, uh, litigation or dispute resolution within WTO. Well, uh, uh, members of the entire industry should club the uh, sources and forces and the resources, resources together to be able to, uh, say, uh, 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 win in the proceeding, or even to participate. That means that several part participants should join their hands in pro uh, such proceedings. Unfortunately, we do not see this happening these days. National players uh, act uh, alone in this uh, field. What are the challenges uh, uh, are presented now by the customs union? If we look at the membership of the Kyrgyzstan, they have lower uh, tie, uh, tie levels, or many uh, tariffs have in Kyrgyz are uh, equal to zero, and we have higher levels, we have higher uh, tariffs, and we can establish uh, uh, high tariffs under our conditions of accession. And if we include Kyrgyzstan at a certain uh, phase in the K customs union, then we should initiate with the Kyrgyzstan in negotiations. And so, sooner than not, those negotiations will lead to situations that Russia will have to make certain concessions. And the customs unions present certain dangers of econ to economic interest of uh, Russia, of the key but participant of this customs union, that is the Russian Federation. As of now, there are in the customs union certain uh, numbers like Belarus, which is to the 25 percent, have uh, agreed the uh, terms for accession. Uh, we fail to understand. We don't have. Uh, we have Kazakhstan, which I think has uh, uh, is ready to uh, say uh, agree on the accession terms to the 90 percent. 90 percent. It's not transparent. We do not see any about the terms of the uh, accession of Kazakhstan. Uh, we do not know what specific situation, uh, what situa situation is specifically uh, for me, how it is formulated in specific relating to specific uh, industries. And uh, of course, uh, uh, there will be, uh, say, more difficult to uh, adopt certain uh, decisions within the customs unions because Russia is a member of WTO, but at the same time it has certain, uh, say, uh, uh, responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis such members of the customs union as Kazakhstan and uh, Belarus. Indeed, uh, uh, very imp of a great importance will be the uh, issue relating to the first uh, test uh, decisions carried to be carried by the court of the EAEC. Then we will see to what extent this court is competent, because how it is competent enough, whether it can uh, consider uh, compensatory or protective uh, measures in an unbiased uh, manner. And the first decisions will be uh, the, those uh, uh, chemical tests which will allow us to understand whether the uh, uh, EAEC uh, court is indeed 
uh, uh, independent supranational body effective. This is of high importance both for the Russian Federation and for the world trading community for our partners. As far as the trade investigations are concerned, I would like to say that indeed we have uh, uh, certain uh, apprehensions that in the near future we will see precedents of uh, appealing to uh, EAEC court and we'll see in practice to what extent uh, those decisions which uh, are taken, uh, measures which are introduced uh, in respect of antidemic measures are in line with the uh, rules of WTO, because after the uh, court of EAEC, the quite possible that the same uh, litigations will be initiated within the WTO framework. The Russia, so far, has successfully uh, regulated the dispute about the uh, uh, utilization as a, uh, a church uh, receiving a recess for, uh, for uh, a year and a half until the uh, end of 2013 we received uh, time to uh, uh, time to uh, rest uh, uh, to what extent we would like uh, well i would like to cite two examples to show how interesting how useful tools of wto can be and also i'll show you uh, give you information about two uh, cases will be reviewed soon the first case deals with the uh, dispute of Antigua and Barbudas again, uh, United States, where it was established that uh, in the online mode, uh, online casino was established rather. Uh, it was established that United States uh, Ill unlawfully, in violation of the WTO requirements, prohibits uh, uh, its uh, citizens to participate in the online casino which was uh, established and was operating from the Antigua territory. And that dispute was reviewed since the trade balance between uh, Antigua and United States uh, is zero, basically. Uh, the, uh, a very paradoxical uh, response was adopted to force United States to uh, to act in uh, whatever way. Uh, uh, permission was given to uh, establish a pirate uh, site, Antigua, and the implementation of this uh, pirate center of the American uh, movies. In order to, uh, up to 21 million uh, a year, Antigua can compensate uh, the, uh, say, uh, revenues uh, missing since uh, United States uh, illegally prohibited to uh, for the citizens to participate in the gambling. Another case was dealt with the uh, marking of uh, markings of tuna fish. Mexico um, supply, uh, penetrated in terms of with the tuna fish uh, to the United States market. The U.S. decided to uh, curb this uh, practice, and uh, in a very cunning uh, way, they did that. They uh, marked. Uh, uh, Cans were saying that where the uh, fish is caught, whether the fish is caught in the United States and use uh, such uh, specific net is used, uh, you know, you know the uh, specific specificity of uh, uh, catching tuna is such. Uh, and in in Mexico, both uh, dolphins and tuna are caught. United States consider that as a cruelty against, uh, uh, say. Uh, uh, fish uh, uh, for fish fauna, if you will, uh, sea uh, uh, resources, uh, which violates the rules of uh, use of nature resources and consider it un uh, uh, improper to uh, uh, have Mexico marketing their tunas in the United States. And in doing so, to, to that end, they decided to uh, introduce specific markings on the cans. And this dispute was uh, reviewed. And since this uh, mark markings was not a, a requirement of a technical requ a requirement, uh, it was such markings was considered to be uh, illegal because it was of a limiting nature. Two more cases which will be reviewed very soon are the cases dealing with the packaging of uh, uh, against Australia. Uh, we have to wind up. We are uh, short of time. 
Well, I'll have one more minute. Uh, you know, what is uh, interesting he, here is that this dispute was initiated by, uh, say, countries which don't have any trade with Australia in terms of the cigarettes. However, we understand that the key players are the key uh, tobacco companies uh, originated uh, stations, originated in the United States. So such integrated approach towards uh, use of uh, tools of the WTO can and should be welcomed and Russia should start using it actively at certain point in time, of course, so that those measures uh, and uh, tools uh, provided by WTO can be used effectively by Russia. Thank you, Ivan. I'm, I'm sorry to, for cutting you short because uh, people say that we are really run out of time. Some people are showing their costly watches, wristwatches, but the final presentation, uh, I don't think that no one will evict us from this uh, room. I will use my, say, uh, privilege and extend the time. Of the final presentation, I believe, will be uh, finishing at a positive note. We'll speak about the uh, attractiveness uh, of uh, the customs unions for new members. And uh, Mr. Malski, a partner in the Astapol lawyers, uh, will be the next uh, and the last speaker in our minds. He was recognized as the best lawyer of 2012. Thank you, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, my presentation is a complicated for two reasons. Uh, in order to assess the attractiveness, uh, it is necessary now to uh, make uh, uh, send, uh, to assess the customs union because attractiveness attractiveness is equal to success. Can we speak about success of the customs union? I think it's too early, premature, and I would fully agree with uh, Nikolai Mizulin, who said that uh, such uh, 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 union is a revolutionary one. It's a complicated, the cumbersome, uh, uh, say, uh, challenge, and to assess its uh, attractiveness for new comp uh, members is too difficult. And the second reason why my uh, uh, presentation may be complicated, my uh, because it is the last presentation in this session, and that prevents I'm standing on your way to the lunch. Uh, that's why any moment I speak uh, is. Uh, a detriment to you. Coming back to the basics, to ABCs, the customs union, regional integration, regional trade agreements, why do we need it for? How uh, it is uh, arranged? Yes, Roger. Well, let me refer to my professor at Georgetown University, John Jackson, who is a real guru in the trade law area, who wrote in his book, Exception for Regional Agreements, Exceptions from the Rules, were only allowed because the theory says that liberalizing trade uh, largely is easier for people who can agree about that faster. And the positive effect from the exemption or exemption should be above the negative effect from the same exception. Therefore, there is a question. For the customs union to be a success, what needs to be done? Well, there's a number of key principles to follow. Understandably, there is an external tariff. Secondly, we need to eliminate internal barriers. As of now, I'm trying to assess the existing customs union. There are some questions arising. I think that the speed of internal integration is not fast enough to make it attractive for new potential member states. New Member states, this is the second nuance that I envisage here. If you are a member state of the customs union now, some states have clear preferences or advantages unrelated to global things like increasing tra uh, volume of trade. For Belarus, it was very important to get oil free of customs duty. And the main nuance when considering the accession of Ukraine to the customs union is uh, the Ukrainian problem with getting natural gas. Key things that somehow mar and uh, distort the general picture. So there are positive factors for being a member state, but increasing the general tariff was a uh, frog leap thing for Kazakhstan and some people say that Kazakhstan has been losing so far because of overall 
rise of the general tariff and too slow a speed of internal integration. And hence a question, what are the prospects of the customs union for potential new member states? There is a number of nations uh, indicated as potential candidates or would-be candidates or interested countries. Those are Ukraine, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and Syria. Uh, if we take smaller states like Kyrgyzstan, according to the economic theory, liberalization is very good for a small country. It is very good for a small country to have an open economy. For other countries, there are both advantages and disadvantages. For Armenia, getting an access to the market uh, will be the main advantage. For Syria, that could also be a political issue. It is very difficult for Ukraine. Why? Because when considering this, we need to understand that uh, export from Ukraine uh, is approximately the same to Russia or to the EU. So the matter of whether Ukraine should exceed the customs union would always be comparable, uh, com analyzed against creating the free tra trade zone with the EU. According to the National Academy of Sciences, the customs union is much more preferential than creating a free trade zone with the EU. EU, strangely as it may sound, but emotions interfere. And is it not the south-to-south -south trade model that you get from the customs union? Well, the south-to-south -south model also raise, gives rise to questions, but most theoreticians thought that regional south-south cooperation is a real uh, utopia because uh, those countries will not be technologically advancing and they will be trading in goods that are knowingly uncompetitive. Uh, there will be no modernization according to that theory and no improvement of competitiveness. Uh, the emotional response, uh, yes, it might be better to strive for the better, but the economic analysis still shows that it would be interesting for Ukraine to become the customs union member. However, there is a matter of WTO. For Ukraine to join the customs union, one of two things should happen. Either the customs union should reduce the duties down to the Ukrainian level or, the, or Ukrainian tariffs should rise. The second option, of course, uh, faces an obstacle named WTO. It is possible to do. The WTO does uh, provide an opportunity to renegotiate, but politically that's very difficult. Ukraine recently stated that it wanted to renegotiate uh, its uh, conditions on 370 positions, and WTO said how it is different from re-exceeding uh, re because like IT people would say it's easier to to boot out and then boot in again in theory with time for the customs union it would be required to reduce the overall level of external duties it is still a problem for Kazakhstan nowadays too fast a growth too fast an increase of external duties and that also makes some industries suffer. However, I think that prospect does exist. For Ukraine, that's a, also a gas price that is an issue and the matter of reducing trade wars. Trade wars, unfortunately, sell are often waged not on the basis of purely protective measures, but on the basis of trade barriers, phytosanitary measures, you name it. The faster the customs union internally is able to handle the non-tariff barriers, the more attractive it becomes for new member states. I liked very much the presentation about the court of the new regional court of the new regional association. And hence another interesting matter. Ukraine uh, was mentioned more than once uh, in this light, in disputes and WTO. And Ukraine is part of four disputes under the WTO. Four disputes for a country that exceeded two or three years back. That's quite a lot. 
The tobacco dispute is the most interesting one, where there are questions how Ukraine gets in, the largest producer of tobacco, but other disputes seem quite reasonable, and there may be a situation arising of competing fora for resolution of those disputes. If Ukraine had not been customs union member, or if Kazakhstan exceeds soon, which of the forum to address to, WTO or the Eurasian court? And what happens next? If the court makes a recommendation, does it deprive me of the right to go to the WTO? Can I run for parallel proceeding? Who will do it faster for me? It sometimes was considered that it would be right to use the prejudicial prejudice at NAFTA. So these questions start to surface. Maybe there are some theoretical answers to them, but practically, no, we don't have any. Anyhow, when joining the customs union, the member, the WTO member states will think what about selecting the uh, forum? Because when you do any transaction, any country will think, if I have a dispute, where do I get the best and most fair decision? Which of the fora is most convenient for me? If the customs union fails to create this mandatory forum, and I agree with people who say that if you set the standard high, Europe went a long and hard way to achieve that standards, rules and practice. But if we want to have a customs union, we should complete the job. And my bold conclusion is this. It's written in my presentation in English, uh, but in Russian I would put it, if you need to do it, do it right. So if integration internally is done fast, and we use well the example of the European integration, which may be the most successful example in the world, then the level of attractiveness of uh, appeal for potential member states would be very high. Thank you, Oleg. We start the discussion since Anna has to leave a little earlier. What, anybody has any questions to her? Please, um, the gentleman in the first row, and please use the microphone. As you speak, we don't have a microphone. Oh, you. The Minister of Industry and Trade, Department for Internal Trade. But I have a question to Anna and Igor. The first question is about coordination of activity of businesses in anti dumping or compensation investigations. Do you think that coordination should be done at the association level or the state, as represented by the Minister of Economy or Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Industry and Trade? Maybe they should create some back office of sorts that would help businesses to coordinate, maybe providing some information support, maybe some other type of support so as to protect their positions better under the WTO. And my second question is, of more practical or legal character that's about the possibility of introducing retro it's the relationship of it's the retro aspect uh, a retrospect a retro, a retrospective actions we know that many Russian companies were face, faced uh, retroactive measures against them, and there is still a debate going on in Russia whether that would be in line with the Constitution or not. So from the very beginning, we seem to be in different non-competitive conditions our law between Russia and the United States, for instance. I would only welcome if more people spoke about that. Anna. Uh, which of the questions intended for me, to me, any, as for retrospective, please use a microphone. That is, uh, there is an opinion indeed that retros retroactive measures would be out of uh, non-compliant with the Constitution. 
that position could be interpreted differently. Uh, there are active debates going on about that, and most experts are inclined to think that cons the Constitution stands in the way of retroactive application of compensation or anti-dumping measures. What about the back office? Should uh, that should be done uh, under some ministry or maybe uh, so as to coordinate well? I'm convinced that initiating uh, anti-dumping or compensation investigations, that's a purely private matter for businesses where the state should not interfere at all. If there are many companies like in light industry or elsewhere, they just need to go and set up their industrial sectoral association to do it. But neither the state nor uh, state kind of uh, quasi-state organizations should do that. But they would come over to say, you're, you're not helping us. We're large companies and industrial unions and foundations wanted to go and help us organizationally. Please express, go and express the will of the state. Protect us because you put us in these conditions because it is you, the state, who made us join, exceed the WTO. We have to suffer now. Go and protect us. So what do we do? Well, I have a feeling, Anna says, that many companies are too lazy to read the agreements and read documents to know how they best protect themselves. That's a specific thing, but that is a, an area where businesses must apply their own efforts too, for at least being able to write the petition well. Yes. In order to write the to drop the petition well, you just need to read the uh, text, take the template and fill it out. That's not a difficult thing to do, and not at all. More opinions, colleagues, about the back office, having a back office, whether we need... First, the speaker, the panelist should... Uh, yes, Anna has to leave. One more question, not more. The quest, the speaker is not using the microphone, so translation is impossible. Sorry. If anyone cares to have the translation, please ask the speakers to use the microphone at all times. Of course, but what we said. Uh, was about initiation of anti-dumping investigation, not consideration of disputes at bodies who are authorized to resolve disputes. Those are two very different processes, colleagues. Well, uh, we see there is discussion, debates, two lawyers, three opinions. Who else would like to respond or uh, ask anything, Igor? Well, I don't agree. What kind of retroactive, according to the WTO, introducing measures before an investigation is not possible to do? You can only introduce some tentative uh, preliminary measures, like in criminal law, you can initiate a case. But uh, you first have to start an investigation first. But preventive measures or preliminary measures or imports control, whatever... Well, I mean that when after preliminary measures a decision is made, then it would be retroactively uh, sent before. No, no, no. It's not retroactive application in its direct sense of the word. Not at all. That's different. Please use the microphone if you want to be translated. Еще вопросы? Можно? Да, пожалуйста. А вот вы мне все время свои часы показываете. Uh, just you're pointing at your watch. Would you like us to 
uh, answer in a briefly br answer in a more briefly, or just you want to ask a question? So my question is the first uh, to the first presenter, Nikolai, as far as I remember. Uh, what you mentioned about the parallelism uh, principle, you are kind of misleading us because in the European Union uh, there is no such thing. There are three groups of issues. The one group that was referred to the European Union, a parallel competence, uh, and, uh, and just the third group, of issues that uh, remains in the competence of the nation states. So I think this is a very important issue indeed, because uh, what are the issues that are to, are to be referred to the customs union uh, when we lose our powers and competences over it completely? And then you uh, said that the customs union will ratify agreements with third countries, third parties. Uh, is it uh, is it kind of a your invention, or there are debates about it? Because the procedure of ratifying international agreements uh, is governed by the constitution uh, and uh, laws on uh, international agreements. So, uh, uh, how the courts are going to rule? Which of the treaties has a priority, and it has to go through the State Duma, and so on. Thank you very much for this very interesting question. Mm, as to the parallelism principle, uh, uh, so it relates to the legal status in its narrow sense, uh, just uh, the ability to carry out activities of a certain entity uh, in the framework of the international organization is uh, just its ability to uh, uh, be party uh, to an international treatment. Uh, and just uh, yes, yes, you rightly notice there are different distributions and delimitation of competences in the European Union. There are issues that are an exclusive prerogative of the supranational structure. There are mixed ones, and just there are the ones that remain under the competence of the nation state. So the parallelism state does not refer to the delimitation of these uh, powers and competences. Uh, there are competences uh, that are fully at the supranational level, so indirectly it follows that the competence to exercise international kind of uh, uh, legal uh, entity right uh, is within it. So, so by cre uh, delegating a certain function to an international organization, we assigned to it the right uh, uh, to uh, deal with other subjects of international law. Of course, uh, just this parallelism issue has always been disputed, and uh, what should be the uh, exclusive, what should be mixed competences, and uh, especially in the context of international uh, legal um, kind of uh, rights of the EU and its uh, separate institutions. However, this principle principle shapes up this idea, but uh, it is not interfering in the distribution of the competence between the supranational and national levels. As to the second question on ratification, so this is a highly debatable issue, and uh, the practice shows that uh, it is difficult to predict how it's going to further develop. But if we follow not only the letter by the spirit of the treatments and agreements uh, that form the, the contractual basis of the EAEC and URI, uh, so it's uh, the ability and right to uh, be part of to the international agreement and uh, negotiating and signing of the agreement and uh, finally to assuming responsibilities and obligations. Uh, so it will depend on the uh, text of the treaties. So some of the treaties uh, basically do not imply any ratification at all. They can uh, be put into force just on the basis of the signature only. But if uh, there are issues are fully referred to the supranational levels and the form of assent to the uh, uh, EAC uh, 
can uh, be a form of uh, assuming the obligation. So it'll, uh, all, it'll, it all it all it all will depend on the content of the treaty. So what the pre provisions uh, are going to be there in the tri tri agreement with Vietnam and others. So I think there will be issues that are not 100% delegated to the competence of the customs union. And you're quite right. Some additional ratification of this agreement will be required uh, by the national parliament. However, uh, in general, if uh, uh, just you touch upon the tariff positions where there is no 100% prerogative I think, uh, yes, uh, so the assent uh, to assume obligations can be dis uh, formed by the, the right, uh, d direct decision. Please, can you bring the mic? Thank you very much. My question is brief and practically oriented. In, uh, uh, it's on the interaction between the Eurozac and the Russian uh, uh, bodies. If uh, uh, Russia were to introduce anti-dumping duties, uh, and there was a decision taking at the customs union Eurozac uh, levels, uh, uh, is there any? Uh, is uh, if uh, the cust uh, so if in such situation, uh, what kind of interaction should be? organized uh, between uh, this, uh, are there any procedures that will be uh, supporting this process or just how is it organized? So the question, yes, is quite uh, interesting. Uh, legally, nobody knows how it's going to be arranged for. Uh, there is no resolution of the government who carries out this function inside the Russian Federation. So if there's going to be a formal dispute, so no one knows who. Uh, uh, will deal with it. Uh, de, de facto, it is known, but the euro, uh, there is no clarity yet. So as to the interaction with the Eurozac uh, on the issues relating to the Eurozac competence, uh, but uh, the WTO as a uh, member state has to uphold is not only uh, is not also resolved, but uh, from in practical domain. There is some interaction going on at the, the national level uh, of the Russian Federation and the supranational level of the Eurozac uh, when they uh, just go to the WTO uh, and uh, deal with uh, their relevant competences. They don't know anything about the customs union yet because this is not party uh, to the members of the WTO. Uh, and just only the representative of the Russian Federation has the competence to speak about it. And uh, on our behalf, on behalf of the customs union, this is a, a situation, opposite situation, because according to the Constitution, the Russian Federation, not this. So these issues are not related to the competence of the government of the Russian Federation. So uh, the Russian Federation flag, uh, using the Russian Federation flag, the Eurozac, and uh, other customs union bodies uh, will uh, make their positions and uh, protect their interests. We'll see how it will develop in the future. Thank you. My question is to the moderator. Uh, in your opinion, uh, with ex Russia's access in WTO, two member states that are not WTO members, uh, should it entail some amendments to the code of the customs union and uh, 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 to the customs code of the customs union? Uh, Two member states, uh, Kazakhstan and Belarus, are not WTO members. So with Russia's accession to WTO, should some accession, as, as amendments uh, be made to the code of the customs union because of the uh, risk of collisions and conflicts? Uh, we are only at the beginning of the accession process and uh, uh, of the amendment process uh, as to the customs code. Uh, we have done a lot to review it. Uh, some of the changes are already there, but uh, it still requires some additional ones. I'm not going to specify which exactly. So it's in a, uh, so the 
customs area it is a duty free um, trade uh, area uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan quite naturally can object to certain preferences uh, that arise when uh, Russia uh, arise in the relationship between Russia and WTO in terms of the customs duties we uh, uh, review it all at the level of the Eurozec. So, well, so well, some disputes and disagreements, because the decision is taken by the uh, co uh, by the council or collegium, whether on uh, depending whether it's a sensitive commodity or not. Uh, so, the the the, the council decision. Uh, the, the council, the board meeting was just held yesterday. The Kazakh uh, delegation uh, came up with uh, their proposals. We satisfied some of them and didn't uh, respond to some others. So we came up with our own proposals. However, all the agreements are settled and uh, resolved. I don't think we face any big challenges or problems there. Now, when we uh, try to further integration and uh, dig deeper, and uh, then it gives rise to disputes and protection of the oppositions and others. As to the customs union and duties regulation, we all pursue our own interests. Uh, Kazakh or Belarus uh, states want to just uh, increase or decrease the duties and others, uh, but this is a matter of uh, effective dialogue which is ongoing. Andrei Kuzmin, uh, editor-in-chief of the Legal St. Petersburg, uh, uh, chair of the Department of the uh, State and uh, Public Law, of one of St. Petersburg-based universities. Uh, so retro my question is about retrospective uh, power of, of, of law. So the Cyprus problem showed that the law doesn't have any uh, uh, kind of uh, return effect. Uh, so my question relates to the, uh, is the question to Viktor Leonidovich Evtukhov. Uh, do you think that uh, by furthering Eurasian integration and deepening it and uh, uh, at the uh, political level, uh, just uh, at the pending uh, Eurasian Union uh, potential and the customs union potentially becoming part of it, will it somehow affect uh, the, the law of the customs union and just Eurasian Union potentially? and uh, whether uh, politi politization of this process will somehow affect economic development of these entities. What do you mean? Uh, prob the problem is between who and who? The uh, problem between WTO and uh, the member states of the customs union in this regard. The customs union is an instrument uh, in order to organize, uh, in order to ensure and deepen integration between the states that are interested in joint uh, political and economic relations. I fully support the Eurasian uh, component and Eurasian direction. Uh, what is uh, promoted by the leaders of the country, not because of that, because I personally think it is a promising direction to move in for us. Uh, largely, we can uh, uh, rely upon the European Union's experience. Uh, we can learn from their mistakes. We can uh, uh, understand what benefits they have now and basing on that, take our own decisions, uh, how to integrate ourselves. But uh, the states that we, are, that we invite uh, are more interested in unifying with us and integrating with us than Russia uh, is interested in integrating with them. Uh, why is that so? Because it opens up new markets for these uh, states. For us, it's a geopolitical issue, and for them, it's more of an economic issue. But we have known each other for a long time. We have a serious and long history of being together. So we're speaking about the member states' uh, 
uh, that were ex-members of the Russian Empire and then of the Soviet Union republics, I think um, it's quite a promising uh, initiative. It would be great if Ukraine were with us as well, but we don't want Ukraine to do the same uh, to us than to the custom what they did to the customs union, just uh, kind of reviewing all the uh, agreed upon uh, principles and rules. Uh, but I hope they'll behave differently in this new case. But I think it will make us stronger and uh, will um, make uh, our negotiating position with the WTO also more powerful. Uh, so some uh, countries are, are closer to w, WTO accession, like Kazakhstan, Belarus, as I just said at the very beginning, with it, but anyway, overall, uh, it is a, a good uh, potential direction for development uh, for both us and these countries. The, the, could you please ask the person to switch on the microphone, because he switches it off as soon as he begins to talk, and I cannot hear what he's saying. So this mechanism operates. We they know the customs code in the, in the presentation of the working group this issue was discussed so here in Russia uh, we have enough information and we are able to formulate our negotiating position let us uh, let us uh, have the last question and we should vacate this room if there are no questions let us thank all the speakers those who participated in the discussions and wish uh, we will let us let success be with us in WTO in Eurasian economic space. Thank you.